So what to talk about today? I feel like there's like four different things we could talk about. We could talk about limits that end up being infinity. That's a good idea. There's an example. There, that's in some of the homework we're working on. We could also talk about continuity. I guess you can't see my face. But like, I'm making a face. We could so let's see. Limits that are infinity. Um, limits of like sine x over x. That's also the thing. Continuity. I feel like there was one more thing on my mind. Can we do one more precise definition of a limit question? Yeah, I feel like we should. Okay, so I'm going to try and phrase this one a little bit like what I've been seeing in the homework because that seems to be sensible to me. In fact, I have an example right over here. I've only got a million papers. Pretty good example right over here. Somehow I lost it. I've only got 20 minutes. Right? We'll find them. I'll just make something up. That's also fine. So, so, I feel like these homework questions, some of them are a little bit like it's a lot of wordiness but we can still make that. So here's an example. Let f of x equal, I'm gonna put something slightly different, 16 minus x squared with c equal to negative one, l equal to 15, and epsilon equal to, let's not be so ridiculous, 0 0.2. We wanna find, a delta greater than zero, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, implies the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. The question we're being asked is, what is delta? Okay, that seems honestly terrible, like a terrible way of writing this question, but it is how they're phrasing it. So, we can work with that. And I would say if I was doing this, the first thing I would do, sorry, would be to rewrite everything with all the things, all the numbers plugged in. So I'm going to rewrite this. Okay, I want zero to be less than the absolute value of x minus minus one, be less than delta. That's what I'm looking for. And I want that to imply that the absolute value of f of x minus minus sorry minus 15 is less than 0 0.2 great we can work with that all right um and i'm going to do the same thing we were doing last time which is that i'm going to try and get a condition on x in both equations the first one's not bad right we're going to have x plus one in fact, I think it's good to draw a picture here. Right, we're just going to be a little bit to the right. There's my delta 2, and a little bit to the left. There's my delta 1. And my function, I don't really care. Function does something like this. Oh, yep, of course. So we're trying to figure out this sort of deal. So we know that x plus one needs to be less than, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm like less than positive delta two, bigger than, I like writing as negative delta one. And then I would subtract one from both sides and say that x is less than negative one plus delta two, bigger than negative one minus delta one. And assuming I've drawn my picture even close to correctly, which I have actually, it looks vaguely like a, a downward opening parabola. I'm pretty convinced already that delta one is going to be the smaller one because this is the more steep part. This is the less steep part. So I'm pretty sure this is going to be smaller than that. And I want the smaller one. We're still going to do it just to see, but I'm pretty sure. So now we're going to work on this. All right. So simple. 
sides here, I've got 16 minus 15 minus x squared. And it's going to be less than 0 0.2, bigger than negative 0 0.2. Now I'm going to work on isolating x. So I'm going to add, subtract one from each side. So negative 0.2 minus one is negative 1.2. Plus the negative x squared plus then 0.2 minus 1 is negative 0 0.8. Then we're going to multiply everything by negative 1. And then we're going to take the square root of everything. So then we're going to set this equal to that. Oops, no, we're not going to set that equal to that. I've got things backwards. Rewrite it. I'm going to rewrite this so that things are in the same order. X should be less than the square root of 1.2 and bigger than the square root of 0 0.8. I'm going to set this equal to this. This equal to that. And figure out which delta is the smaller of the two. All right, so. Negative one minus delta one equals the square root of 0 0.8. That's going to give me delta one equals negative one. That seems like a problem. Seems like a real problem. Seems like I made a mistake somewhere. Oh, I did make a mistake somewhere. It's a, but it's an easy mistake. So I made a mistake that's easy to make. Right here, when I went from this step to this step. I needed to remember that x is really negative. Right, we're over here next to negative one. So I really should have said x actually needs to be between the negative square root of one point two and the negative square root of zero point eight. That's a really easy mistake to make, which means my inequalities are actually out of order. Let's. I got all the papers here over here. What I really need to have is instead of this, what I really want is x needs to be bigger than the negative square root of 1.2 and less than the negative square root of 0 0.8. It should be it should be less than the one that's bigger and bigger than the one that's smaller. Question. Um, multiply each one of them. I, didn't you multiply each of them with negative one? Though? I did. So, so, so what I'm saying is, you're right. I did, mm -hmm. but I, I should have. I need to do something different, right? So from here to here, right? So the problem is, this is not right, because we know that we should be over here on either side of negative one, and x definitely isn't close to negative one here. So I should have actually, when I took the square root of everything, realized, oh, x actually needs to be negative. And the square root of x squared of x is negative is actually negative. So here's, here's, okay, here's really the step. It's going to look a little funky. Let me cross this out. So when I, when I do this, that's totally correct. Now we're going to take the square root of everything. Square root of 1.2 is 1.2. The square root of x squared is usually x if x is positive. But if x is negative, which it is in this particular situation, right? X should be close to negative one. The square root of x squared is actually negative x. Or more generally, the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. So if x is positive, fine. If x is negative, the square root of x squared is negative x. Tricky. And then we multiply everything by negative one and we get negative square root of 1.2 less than positive X, less than negative square root of 0 0.8, which is actually what we want. Okay, so yeah. Uh, in the event that we're not, not able to visualize the graph, how do we know which one to take? Like, the negative side of the graph? Well, so we don't, so luckily we don't need to be able to visualize the graph. We just have to know what the C value is. So here, since our C was negative, we should be thinking of our X as negative because C is getting closer, or X is getting closer and closer to this negative C value. 
Yeah, good question. That's a really, that's an excellent thing to think about. Oh yeah, if we know x is getting close to negative. Great. So now finally, we're gonna set actually this equal to that and this equal to that. And I want to remind everybody, how did I know I was going wrong? Well, I got to this place here where I was about to say that delta one was negative one minus the square root of 0 0.8. And I knew that was wrong. And you should know that was wrong too, because we're getting a negative value for delta and delta should be always positive. So this is like, oh shoot, I did something wrong. I had to go back and figure out what I was doing wrong. And we figured it out. Cool. So, Things here. Oh, there's a question. Let's see. There's a line tangent at a point for going. So um, we might not get there today about covering tangents at a point. We'll see. We kind of, there's still a lot of things to say before that. Not that it's not possible, just there's a lot of other things. So yeah. Um, how do we figure this out? So now I'm going to set that equal to that. So negative one minus delta one equals negative square root of 1.2. And hopefully things turn out to be positive. I think they do. If I add this over here, add that over there. Great, it's positive. And then for here, solving for delta two, negative one plus delta two equals the negative square root of zero point eight. So delta two equals one minus the square root of zero point eight. And then you have to figure out which of those is smaller. And I know it's this one. How do I know it's that one? Well, the square root function, as you go further to the right, grows more slowly. So I know that the difference between the square root of 1.2 and 1 is a smaller difference than the square root of 0 0.8 and 1. Because if I move 0.2 to the right, I'm going to get less vertical movement than if I move 0.2 to the left. Or you could just use a calculator, right? That is also a perfectly valid option. I have to like log into my phone because you don't get the cool calculator unless you've done the thing, right? But if we actually do it, let's see. So I want square root of one point two. You want to do things backwards with this calculator. So this is square root of one point two minus one. So great, that's about zero point zero nine five, and then we want the square root of we want one minus the square root of 0 0.8. So 0.8, square root it, minus one. So we get positive, right? I did that more exciting than it was going to be. This is going to be about 0 0.1055. There we go. Not much smaller. Questions, concerns. So this is the same thing we were doing last class. The only real difference here is that we are now using specific value of epsilon and trying to find a specific value of delta. That's kind of the only difference here. But for these nonlinear ones, you have to think about which one's going to be the smaller one. And so the actual answer that we should input here, like if, we, if I was submitting this work through web work, the answer I would write would be this negative one plus the square root of 1.2, or square root of 1.2 minus one, however you want to write it. But we shouldn't put in the decimal approximation. Yeah. When did the value of epsilon and delta be the same? They're typically only the same if your function that you were trying to do this process for is a straight line with a slope of positive or negative one. So I will just point out that for lines like y equals mx plus b, if you're doing this whole delta epsilon process, your delta is always equal to epsilon divided by the absolute value of the slope. So if your slope is plus or minus one, then your delta equals your epsilon. And for and you, I suppose it's possible you might have some weird what's the word I'm looking for nonlinear equation where you happen to have picked numbers or they happen to pick numbers where it ends up that epsilon equals delta. It's probably not very likely though. It could happen though. All right. So yeah, that's on my paper right there. Thumbs, all thumbs. So that said, I'm certainly, if you have more questions about the self epsilon stuff, 
don't hesitate to get more help from, from me about it. But I feel like we should move on to other things. We should probably talk more about limits. There's a lot more limit things to talk about. Can you talk about speed Yes. Like how would you um like do things with that uh, on the five? Right. Yes, exactly. So grab my notes here. So the squeeze theorem comes up in a couple of different places. Most often when you are talking about limits to infinity, not always, but a lot of the time. So here's kind of a very typical example. Limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of x divided by x. I wanna know what's happening here. Well, I don't, but I do know something about cosine. And so, a lot of the time, your squeeze theorem problems are going to have a sine or a cosine in them because we know the boundaries for sine and cosine. We know that cosine of x is between positive one and negative one. And that's true for cosine of anything. It's also true for sine of anything. And sine of, I don't care what's in there, sine of anything is always between negative one and one. And then the whole idea is to make the thing in the middle look like the thing you're trying to take the limit of. So what do I need to do to each part of this compound inequality to make it look like the middle is cosine x over x? Just do what you want. I'm gonna divide everything by x. Now you're just gonna do the thing to make it look like what you want. So if I divide this by x, I divide everything by x. And then we take the limit of the outer bounds. And we hope very strongly that their limits are the same. Because if they're not, we can't use the squeeze term. The limit as x goes to infinity of negative one over x is what? I know I kind of garbled those words there. The limit as x goes to infinity of negative one over x is what? Right. If the fraction has a denominator that's getting large, the overall value is getting small. Closer and closer and closer to zero. Similarly, the limit as x goes to infinity of positive one over x is also zero. These two facts combined tell us that, well, if the limit of that's zero and the limit of that's zero, and this is in between them, then this limit also has to be zero. Must be zero as well by the squeeze theorem. So that's kind of the idea of the squeeze theorem. Is if you're trying to find something on either side of the thing you actually want to take the limit of, so and whose limits are the same. Sure, yes. I would say, so I wouldn't say that one over infinity is equal to zero, but I would say that one over something that's getting infinitely large is closer and closer to zero. So more generally, yes. You take a limit and you have something, and it doesn't even have to be one, it can be any not, it can be any constant divided by something that's being infinitely large, the limit is always zero. So and everything's out of all my notes are everywhere. I can't keep track of anything. Sorry. Okay, so let's say we want to find let's do that. The limit. As x approaches three of, I'm going to x minus three times sine of pi over x minus three squared. Yeah, that's funky looking. So, can we just plug in three? I mean, we could. Is it going to work? No. Why is it going to work? Division by zero. Always a problem. So we don't know what this limit is. But let's hope I've done. Yeah, I think I've done this. Okay. We can certainly say that sine of whatever, in this case, pi over x minus three squared, is certainly between one and negative one. 
For sure, 100%, no doubt about it. And then we can definitely multiply everything by x minus three. All right, and now we're gonna take the limit of the outer boundaries. The limit as x approaches three of negative x minus three is gonna be zero. And we just plug in three, three minus three is zero. And the limit as x approaches three of positive x minus three is also zero. And since the limits of those things are the same, then we have to get by the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches three of x minus three times sine of pi over x minus three squared must equal zero. There's no other choice. Here's what's going on graphically. Come on, give me the thing. One sec. Welcome, let me see your symptom survey. You here for Toyo Day? Yeah. Okay. So, there are the boundaries, x minus three and x, and negative x minus three. And now, here is the thing we're actually looking at. x minus three times sign of some trash pi divided by x minus three squared. And you can totally see, I think, right, that as we get close, but this function in green is stuck between these two functions, right? And you can zoom out if you want to see, oh yeah, it's totally stuck between them. But if you zoom in, right? We are really bounded by those. And so even though it's doing this crazy oscillation back and forth, you I mean, let me put a little bit closer the number. Thank you. Um, right. As we go back and forth, back and forth, we're getting smooshed down to zero because both of those outer functions are going to zero. So that's really the idea of the squeeze theorem, is that we are bounded above and below. And so as they both come towards the same value, the function that is between them is stuck. And it goes to that same value as well. Kind of neat. Yeah. How do we know that it's bounded by x minus three above the ground? So, one more time, sorry. How do you know that it's bounded by x minus three above the ground? Well, so, that, so that's the whole thing about it. We really, you only typically answer these questions for things like sine, right? So, right, we know because of this. Oh, that's kind of great. Okay. Right, we know that sine of anything is always less than or equal to one. And sine of anything is always greater than one. And then we multiplied everything by x minus three. So it has to be true that x minus three times sine of whatever is less than or equal to x minus three times one. That's how we know. But really we know because of this. Because sine of I don't care is less than or equal to one. That makes sense? Okay. Other questions about this? Yeah. So I will point out sometimes we multiply sign by something. So here's another, here's one more. Whoops. So yes, you put a negative one on the either side specifically for sine or cosine, right? Sine and cosine, right? If you think about the graphs of sine and cosine, again. Let's use the tools we've got. Really hard to see that. Let me scoot this over. There we go. I can see that better now. Right? If you just graph sine and cosine, let's go back to the regular zoom here. Oh, yeah. That's between negative one and one. And same thing for cosine. But for the most part, those are the only functions. I mean, they're not the only functions. But they're, they're kind of the best examples of functions we readily know their bounds for, right? That are limited. 
there are some other ones like inverse tangent and some other things, but sine and cosine are kind of our prime examples of, oh yeah, these functions are stuck between two other numbers. So we can relatively easily apply the squeeze theorem, theorem to them. Let me give you one more example of a squeeze theorem question. Well, maybe two, but certainly one. Um, limit as x goes to infinity. Oh, thank you. Yes, always let me know, please. As x goes to infinity. Oh, sure, let's not make it too terrible. Uh, 2x squared plus. 3x minus 5 cosine of x over 3x squared plus 7. And if it weren't for that cosine there, you would all tell me that this limit was what? Two thirds, right? You would use the rule for limits to infinity of quotients, which says if the degrees are the same, the limit is the quotient of the leading coefficients. And it's totally true that the limit as x goes to infinity of, say, 2x squared plus 3x, I'm going to say minus 5 over 3x squared plus 7. We know that's equal to 2 thirds. Question. Great. So the rule says if you have the limit as x goes to infinity or negative infinity, actually, of some polynomial divided by another polynomial, so say some like Mm. some a times x to the n plus lower powers of x over some b times x to the same power plus lower powers of x, that limit is going to equal a divided by b. It's always true if the highest power in the numerator and the denominator are the same. They're different. There are other rules that apply. Um, but what I want to point out here is that we can, well, not only can we, we kind of have to use the squeeze theorem to show that this limit is also two thirds. So here's the way I like to do it. I like to say, well, I know that cosine of x is between negative one and one. That's always where I'm going to start. And then my job is to make this middle part look like the thing I want to take the limit of. So first I'm going to multiply everything by negative five. So I'm going to get positive 5 bigger than or equal to negative 5 times cosine of x, bigger than or equal to negative 5. And I might change around the order of that because that feels annoying to write it in the, in the opposite way we're used to. So I might rewrite this as negative 5 less than or equal to negative 5 cosine of x less than or equal to 5. And then I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to add the other stuff on top I need. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to add 2x squared plus 3x to every piece of this inequality. So 2x squared plus 3x minus 5 is less than or equal to 2x squared plus 3x minus 5 cosine of x is less than or equal to 2x squared plus 3x plus 5. And then to save space, I'm going to divide everything by the same denominator. Well, look at that. So let me ask everybody, what's the limit as x goes to infinity of this right-hand piece here? It's got to be two-thirds. What's the limit of this piece here? Also two-thirds. So we can definitely say the limit as x goes to infinity of, kind of a pain to write, 2x squared plus 3x plus 5 over 3x squared plus 7 equals two-thirds. And also the same thing is true for the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x squared plus 3x minus 5 over 3x squared plus 7. And so then by the squeeze theorem, it is true that the thing in the middle also has to have the same limit since those are the same. It must equal two-thirds. So that's another example of a squeeze theorem problem. Um, let's see what kind of Okay. 
Yeah, there's one more squeeze term problem we should talk about. Well, we're probably not actually going to use the squeeze term for it, but we might later on. Um, when you plugged in the okay. So someone asked the question, I was hoping you yes. So how did we get infinite? How did we get this equal to two terms? Well, we use this rule, but how is this rule really working? Here's how this rule is really working. So the idea behind taking the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x squared plus 3x minus 5 over 3x squared plus 7, or more generally, any polynomial divided by another polynomial, or what we call a rational function. When you're trying to find the limit as x goes to infinity of some rational function, the process I typically encourage everyone to use is having to show your work. Right? If you don't have to show your work, just say the limit's two terms. But if there's someone to ask you to actually show your work for a problem like this, the work I would encourage you to show is you want to divide everything by the highest, by x to the highest power that's in the denominator. So I want to divide everything here by x squared. So I'm going to get 2x squared over x squared. I'm going to get 3x over x squared. I'm going to get minus 5 over x squared over 3x squared over x squared plus 7 over x squared. And I would encourage you to actually not write this step and just skip to the step where you've done the simplifying. 2x squared over x squared is 2. 3x over x squared simplifies to 3 over x. 5 over x squared doesn't simplify. And then 3x squared over x squared is 3. And 7 over x squared is 7 over x squared. And now, as x goes to infinity, what happens to 3 divided by x? Does it get big? Does it get small? Super small. How about 5 over x squared? Even smaller. How about 7 over x squared? All the things that are divided by x or x to some positive power get much, much, much smaller as x gets much, much, much larger. And so we end up getting 2 plus 0 minus 0 over 3 plus 0, which is 2 thirds. That's how we're getting the 2 thirds there. Um, and it's the process we use whether or not we have the powers being the same or the powers being different. So if you wanted to find, say, the limit as x goes to infinity of, say, I don't know, 5x cubed plus 4x minus 1 over 2x squared plus 3, you would also divide the top and bottom or everything, I should say, by the highest power of x in the denominator. So you want to divide everything by x squared here. So 5x cubed divided by x squared is going to be 5x. 4x divided by x squared is 4 over x minus 1 over x squared over 2 plus 3 over x squared. And now if we let x go to infinity, well, again, the things divided by x are going to do what? Thank you. Yes, I saw some zeros there. So what am I left with? Well, what am I left with? So I don't want to say I'm left with a 5x over 2. Because technically, I should be letting all the x's go to infinity at the same time. So I really should say I'm left with a 5 times infinity plus 0 plus 0 over 2 plus 0. See, 5 times infinity, still infinity. Plus zero, still infinity, divided by two, still infinitely large. Okay. So when your degree on top is larger than your degree on the bottom, you typically get some sort of infinity. I mean, your limit's going to be either positive infinity or negative infinity. It makes sense because the top is growing faster than the bottom. Right? The degree on top is larger, it's getting bigger faster than the bottom. On the other hand, if you had something that was, say, where like the numerator had a lesser degree, I'm just going to flip this over. We would divide everything by the highest power of x in the denominator. So we're going to the limit as x goes to infinity of. So I'm dividing everything by x cubed now. We're getting 2 over x plus 3 over x cubed over 5 plus 4 over x squared minus 1 over x cubed. And as x goes to infinity, I get a 0 plus 0 on top over a 5 plus 0 minus 0 on the bottom. And 0 divided by not 0 is 0. 
Zero divided by zero, as we've seen, is a problem, right? A lot of our limits have been the zero over zero type, and those are indeterminate, require more work. But zero divided by five is just zero. Great, happy about that. Okay. There is one other kind of limit. Well, actually, that's not true. There's more than one other kind of limit, I'm about, but there is one other specific zero over zero limit, which I do need to mention. And you probably maybe already encountered it. It's the limit as x goes to zero of sine of x over x. There is a way of proving this limit. We don't really have the time to do it right now. It's a geometric proof. It's not like super hard. It just requires time. What I will do is, if you want me to next class, I will totally go over it. I will also post um, something I've written about it already that shows you how the geometric argument works. It's nothing you should ever have to reproduce. But it is good to see so that you actually believe that this limit is equal to one. Um, what I think about the saying really is that I don't want to say too many, I'm, I'm about to say too many things here, really. No, I'm not. I'm just going to show you this instead. So here is not a proof, but very good evidence that the limit is actually what we think it is. So there's the graph of sine of x over x. And if we look at values of x as x gets closer and closer to zero, sorry, values of y as x gets closer and closer to zero, it seems that those values of y are getting closer and closer to what? It looks like we're getting close to one. Do we actually get there? Oh, I mean, it's not really one. It's just so close to one that they're approximating it as one. But at zero, right, obviously it's undefined because it's zero over zero. But I think this is, now, again, not proof, but good evidence that, yeah, that limit's definitely one, for sure, no doubt about it. And again, we can prove it some other time. So this limit is equal to one. And the reason I want to mention this is because often you'll be asked in this class to find other limits, like say the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 5x over 3x. And while we might later on be permitted to use L'Hopital's rule to do something like this. You shouldn't be doing that now. Your teacher's gonna be like, don't, they're, they're not, they might not say it, but every teacher right now is thinking, don't use L'Hopital's rule for this. So don't use L'Hopital's rule for this, even if you know what that is. If you don't, that's okay, that's fine, that's great. If you don't know L'Hopital's rule, you're in the right spot. So to do this without using L'Hopital's rule, in fact, I should say something before I do this, what you really wanna know is that more generally, the limit as of sine of some stuff over the same stuff as the stuff goes to zero, that limit's always going to be one. So just some real quick examples that we're not even going to think about. The limit as x goes to zero of sine of 3x over 3x, definitely one. Or the limit as I don't know, x goes to two thirds of sine of six x minus four over six x minus four goes to one. As long as it's sine of stuff over the same exact stuff and the stuff is going to zero, well, x is going to two thirds, but six times two thirds minus four is zero. So the stuff is still going to zero. As long as those two conditions are met, that limit has to be one. Another example of this, the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of 1 over x squared over 1 over x squared. Or someone might write this as the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared times sine of 1 over x squared. But we still are meeting all the conditions. I've got sine of stuff divided by the same exact stuff, and the stuff is going to zero. So, good question. How would you show the work for something like this? Well, here's what I would do. And there's a, there's, there's a few different schools of thought on this. What I always come up with this is what I like to call the wish method. It's not, this is something I've never heard anyone else say before. It's fine. The question I'm really asking myself is, what do I wish I had beneath sine of five? What would be really nice to have right there? 5x, that's what I wish I had. 
okay? I made my list in two, I got five X, but now it's not the same. So I need to adjust for my wish. I know I need to have that three X in the denominator and I'm going to put another five X in the numerator to cancel out the five X added in. This expression is the same. Now I can do some algebra. I can cancel some X's. Those X's definitely cancel. And if you really want, you can take this 5 thirds constant and bring it out in front of the limit. That's one of our rules of limits. If you have a limit of a constant times a function, you can bring the constant out. Most people don't do that. They're just kind of lazy. But we could say, oh, yeah, that's going to be 5 thirds times the limit as X goes to 0 of sine of 5X over 5X. And then we're just going to say that is 1, because it is. So we get five thirds times one, which is five thirds. And that's about as much work as I know how to show for a question like this. The only way to really show more work here is to kind of like do the whole geometric proof, which is definitely not what you're being asked to do. So this is the amount of work I would show. So in, 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 the, uh, in the example of the terms, the likelihood of us needing to prove that statement is... No one's going to ask you to prove that on an exam. Or if they do, they're, they have teaching problems. They, no one should be asking you to prove this limit on an exam. It's unreasonable. Question? Uh, will we have to prove anything on our exam? Um, I mean, that, that, that is possible. Um, you, someone could ask you to prove a thing. Someone could ask you to say use the intermediate value theorem to prove that an equation has a solution on some interval. That's or maybe, but I would use I would probably use the word more show there. So I would say there's not there's not a lot of proof in this, but there might be some very limited amount of proving things. Um, to answer the question in the chat, I didn't actually multiply by five x over three x. I multiply by 5x over 5x, right? I started with this, I multiply by that. Let me show you another example. Is there a name for this rule? It's, it's a rule I made up. I call it the wish method. Oh, no, no, I meant the thing on the right where like stuff divided by stuff equals. Well, so I wouldn't say stuff divided by stuff. Oh, sign stuff divided by stuff. Right, and so, but really, so I want to point out, and this is very important, sine of x divided by x, doesn't equal anything in particular. This is definitely not equal to one. It's a function, right? We graphed it. It's got lots and lots and lots of different values. To say that this is equal to one, you have to have the limit as well. And because the limit notation means you're asking the question, right? That's what you should really think about. When you see a limit, you're being asked a question. That limit is asking you, what is this function doing as x gets closer and closer to zero. And oh, this function happens to be getting closer to one. Um, I don't think there's a specific name for this rule, but it's a very, very, very standard limit to talk about. I would say the name of the rule is the limit for sine of x over x. That's yeah, there's not really a better way to say it. Um, well, let's look at another example because I want to show kind of a little bit more of the thought process of how I really kind of write this, which is. If I'm starting something like the limit as x goes to zero of, I don't know, sine of 9x over 2x, what I really actually like to do is I like to rewrite the fraction in two pieces. I'm going to rewrite this fraction kind of in a not great looking way, where I have sine of 9x on top and 2x on the bottom. And at this point, I haven't changed anything, right? It's still the same fraction, the same limit. But now I'm going to add in the pieces I want. So I'm really just going to multiply by one. Specifically, 9x divided by 9x, because I want to have, or I wish I had, a 9x beneath the sine of 9x. You always want to be matching the stuff that's inside the sine function, because that's the part that you can't really modify it. So hopefully that kind of helps you see that we're actually not multiplying by 9x over 2x. We're multiplying this original thing by 9x over 9x. You can totally write it that way. So like I do it this way because this is just what my brain has always thought of. But another equally valid way to approach this would be to say, well, I know, and really you don't actually need the x there. 
I just like it because it makes it look nice. But if you really want it, you can say, well, look, James, I know I need to multiply by a nine over n. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply it by nine over nine. Great. So I am going to rewrite this now as the limit as x goes to zero of, well, I really want to write this as nine halves times sine of nine x over nine x. I didn't change anything. I just rearranged where things live. And then if you really want, you can bring the nine half in front. I don't think you need to. Most people just go straight from this and say, okay, you've got nine halves times one. That's it. It gets a little more complicated when you have something like this. The limit as x goes to zero of sine squared of four x over three x squared. And yeah. So here is where I do think this writing it as a couple of different fractions actually really helps. I'm going to rewrite this in the following way. The limit is x goes to zero of sine of 4x times sine of 4x divided by 3x squared. What do I wish I had beneath sine of 4x? But if I divide by 4x, I need to multiply by 4x. What do I wish I had beneath sine of 4x? That's how I like to approach that problem. Then the limit of this part is going to be 1. The limit of this part is going to be 1. And this part is going to reduce down to, well, the x's cancel. I'm going to get 16 over 3 there. So if I'm really writing out the work, I could say it's going to be 16 over 3 times the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 4x over 4x times sine of 4x over 4x. And then I would say, oh, that's 16 thirds times 1 times 1. I will again say, this is not the only way to do this. This is just a way that I think works pretty nicely. Questions? Time is it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and talk about that stuff next week. So, let's talk a little bit more. We might as well stick with limits for the next 10 minutes before I got to go. So, normally, class, for those of you that are brand new today, normally class would go until 11 50, but I have to leave early because I'm going to go see a show with my niece and nephew and other family members and I got to be there on time so got to go at 11. um but yeah oh, okay so let's talk about limits like that where instead of getting a zero over zero which we often see we're going to get a non-zero number divided by zero so let's say we want to look at something like the limit as x approaches negative one of 2x squared plus 5x plus 3 divided by x squared minus 1. Um, that's actually, sorry, that is not what I meant to write. That's all right. So sometimes you write the wrong thing. It's okay. If we looked at this limit, we would still start at the beginning, which means the first thing we try is plugging it in. If you plug it in, you get 2 times negative 1 squared plus 5 times negative 1 plus 3 over negative one squared minus one, which is going to be two minus five plus three. Oh, that's a zero over zero. Not what I meant to happen. All right. So in this case, we would do the usual type of thing where we try to factor out and cancel the thing that's making it zero on top one. In this case, we know since X is approaching negative one, it's an X plus one factor that's problematic. So easily we can see that the denominator factor is X minus one times X plus one. Now, here's what I would encourage you all to think about. We know x plus 1 needs to be a factor in the numerator. I'm not great at factoring that polynomial. 
But I am great at it if I know that x plus one has to be a factor. If x plus one has to be a factor, the other factor better have a two x, so that x times two x is two x squared, and better have a plus three, so that one times three is three. I'm 100% confident without even checking that that is how it has to factor. Because zero on top means x plus one had to have been a factor, and the other things have to be that. Cancel the x plus ones. And then we get to plug in a negative one for the remaining x's, and we get two times negative one plus three over negative one minus one, which is, let's see, one over negative two or negative one half. So that's how we deal with things like that. And I will point out if you're thinking about vertical asymptotes, all right, so if you ask, where does this? have a vertical asymptote? Well, you have to be a little extra careful in this particular problem. Usually, usually, you can get away with just saying, it's wherever the denominator is zero. But more specifically, it's wherever the denominator is zero and the numerator isn't, probably. Meaning, if both the numerator and the denominator are zero, you can kind of have anything happen. You might still get a vertical asymptote there, you might not. In this case, we don't, right? When you plug in negative one, or when you approach negative one, the limit isn't going to some sort of infinity. You're not getting a vertical asymptote there. You're getting a hole in the graph. So we would say that this function has a vertical asymptote specifically and only at x equal to positive one. Because that's a value of x that's making the denominator zero and the numerator not. So when you have a non-zero number divided by zero, your fraction blows up. It gets infinitely large. So that's kind of the impetus for how we deal with limits where you have a non-zero number divided by zero. For example, the limit as x approaches one from the left of two x plus three, oops, that's a three, divided by x minus one. Here, if we quote unquote plug in the value of x, we're going to get five over zero. Not super helpful. Well, not exactly true, actually. It is pretty helpful. We just have to think about what signs we have. So if we're a little bit more thoughtful, we know that x is slightly less than one. So I'm going to pretend for a second that x is, I don't know, 0 0.999. And if I do that, then my function, I'm going to say that's my function f of 0 0.999 is going to be approximately, I don't really care about making the top exact. The top I'm going to say is 5, because I'm essentially plugging in 1. It's not going to matter that it's really 4.998 or whatever it would be if you did 2 times 0 0.999 plus 3. On the other hand, the denominator is where I really have to think about things. 0 0.999 minus 1 is negative 0 0.001 or negative 1 1,000. So I essentially have got five divided by negative 1 1,000, which is equal to what? Well, it's negative. And is it bigger? Yeah, I heard someone say it's negative 5,000, which is pretty big. And the smaller that denominator gets, the larger this fraction gets. So as X gets closer and closer to one, my fraction is going to get really, really large but it's going to be really negatively large. So what I'm actually going to do when I do this is I'm going to think about, well, the numerator is five, great, that's positive. The denominator is close to zero, but it is slightly negative. And that's a notation that most of us use in the ATC is that if you're, if you're close to zero, but you're negative, you write a zero with a negative super zero. And then a non-zero number divided by zero is infinitely large. This one happens to be negatively infinitely large. And that's really kind of all the work I'm used to showing for a problem like that. So on the other side, if we were doing the limit as x approaches one from the right of two x plus three over x plus one, sorry, x minus one, I would say, well, that's essentially 
five over a positive small number. And then that's going to be positive. And so the takeaway is two things. One, when you take a limit like this, you get a non-zero number divided by zero. The limit's going to not exist. But specifically, it's going to not exist either being infinitely large or negatively infinitely large. Or if you take the double-sided limit in this case, if you were asking about the limit as x approached one of two x plus three over x minus one, you would say that that limit does not exist because the right side and the left side are going towards different infinite values. On the other hand, if they were going towards the same infinite value, ah, come on, thumbs. So if we were looking at something like the limit as x approaches negative two of x squared plus one over mm, x plus two to the fourth, well, we look at the limit from the left, So again, I'm plugging in negative two, negative two squared is four, plus one is five. I should actually write the thing before I start plugging in it though. So I'm gonna get five on top. If I'm less than negative two, like negative three, I know that's two bits less squared. Is this gonna be a slightly positive or a slightly negative number inside the parentheses? Slightly negative. Although that doesn't matter because we're raising it to an even power. So it's going to be slightly positive overall. So we have a positive or positive, great infinity. On the other side of things, if we approach negative two from the right, sorry, negative two from the right, then we're going to get still five on top. Because again, for the thing where it's not zero, I'm just going to plug in the value, right? I'm not going to try and be like, it's closed. No, just plugging in negative two, I get four plus one, which is five. And then on the bottom, it's a slightly positive number to the fourth power, which is still positive. So in this case, I would say that the limit of x approaches negative two from either side is going to be infinity. And again, I should re-emphasize: none of these limits actually exist. We say they're infinity because we recognize that the function is getting larger and larger and larger and larger and larger as we zone in on negative two, but Infinity is not a real number. So none of these limits exist. We're just trying to be more descriptive about what this non-existence actually looks like. 